الله الله لا إله إلا الله 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 Look in the creations of the heavens and the earth and everything that's in between and in the way that he manages his creation right in the alternation of the day and the night a science for men to reflect so when we look at all these three verses in four weeks ago we talked about we, we, we were discussing this in greater detail we can extrapolate one big principle and this is how then we should work within our ambit of knowledge if we talk about Rukun Iman, Rukun Islam where does this fall? because this belongs to a bigger principle Right? It's not simply just Rukun Iman one chunk, Rukun Islam one chunk, then that's it. Right? And so in, in looking at these various uh, verses of the Quran, we can see that there is an intimate relationship between the Creator, which is Allah, and the creation, which is all of us. To such, to such an extent that he, he tells us that He's not only near, but He's intimate. He's nearer to us than a juggler vein. And then when we fall, when we, when we make our mistakes, he says, La taqna tu mirhamatillah. Do not despair of the mercy of Allah. So get up, revent, uh, uh, repent, and, and start again. And then third, he says, if you look at my creation and my management of this creation, these are signs of my existence. So he's always with us, all around us. And that's why in the Islamic understanding, um, even our fellow brothers that we are praying beside, these are signs in which Allah sent to us to show that Allah exists. Because He is the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as much as you are. So when you look at today, we have, mashallah, five softs for Zuhur. Right? This amount of brotherhood in, in this area. Uh, you know, and, and the more we are exposed to the different people uh, that's working here, and every day we come and see them, we should get to know who they are. Because each one of them is sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us a chance to get to know Allah better. Because each one of our brothers and sisters here that, are, that, that comes here or in the phase of our lives that we meet brings with them a plethora, a, a, a wealth of experiences, a wealth of knowledge, um, a wealth of maturity that when we begin to exchange uh, these experiences, then we ourselves benefit from this in a steeper slope, faster. And then three weeks ago, we examined another, another big principle. So we begin by talking about Islam being a complete way of life, a deen. And this is constituted with three basic branches. One, which is our belief system, Arkanul Iman. And we discuss in great detail what they are. And then we talk about our actions, which are our Arkanul Islam. There are five of them. right? Uh, and we also discuss in great detail what they are. And finally, the aspects of Islam which is that when we serve Allah, it is as though we see Him. If we don't see Him, then He definitely sees us. Right? And after we examine all these three uh, major branches, we come also to extrapolate one another major principle in Islam. And the second principle that we talk about is that there is an, this intimacy that we talk about in, in f four weeks ago comes from His guidance. Right? We do not get to feel this intimacy if we do not believe in Allah if we do not act through that relationship that we have with Allah and we will not also get the intimacy, intimacy if we do not perform, if we do not manifest those belief systems in some form of action. This means the prayers, the zakat, being kind, being compassionate, being courteous and so on and so forth. Right? So this was the second principle which we talked about last week. And so this week, we want to venture into something slightly more technical. We want to explore what do we mean by relationships in Islam? Right now, so two very things came out quite clearly when we talk about the beauty of Islam one month ago. Allah says in the Quran, there is this relationship where we talk, where He talks about, which is hablu min Allah, a relationship with Allah, and hablu min nas, our relationship between or amongst mankind. And this is manifested in, and this is where we see how our Arkanul Iman and our Arkanul Islam uh, falls under this big picture. When we talk about our relationship with Allah, we talk about our prayers. Right? Because prayer, uh, in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu the prayer of a mu'min is his intimate communication with his Lord. So if you are a mu'min, and if you pray in the prayer that is full of khushu and dedication, then that prayer is an intimate conversation that you have with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Because today we have, for example, 200 people who are praying in this mosque. But in this one mosque, there are 200 different prayers. 200 different salat because each of us bring with us 
a state of a heart. How present is a heart in this prayer? So if it is, it is an intimate, if we are completely present and we leave behind, once we enter the mosque, we leave behind what's going on in the office. Because this becomes a riyadah for us, a relaxation. And this is what prayer is supposed to be. It's not supposed to tax you. You relax. And when you pray, this was as if our last prayer. So you are completely immersed in this prayer. And then we be transformed with that prayer. And this is what we call intimate conversation with our Lord. Right? Beyond the ritualistic uh, uh, recitations that we make. Right? Our dua. Right? What is contained in our hearts. And this is what we call a relationship that we build with Allah. And also with regards to fasting. With regards to zakat or with regards to pilgrimage. All these are manifestations. So we look at some of all this arkan Islam that we've learned before. It falls under this category where we talk about our relationship with Allah. Because we physically manifest that faith into some form of a working faith. That we have to manifest in some physical movement or motion. Right? And then we have Habdumin and Nas. And then we look in the, to the big picture of what Islam teaches us. Then we have, for example, uh, rulings and fatwas on finance, on, on fara'id, inheritance, there's uh, do's and don'ts, halal and haram with regards to marriage, and even in divorce, there are responsibilities after a divorce, uh, you know, with regards to food and drinks. So this is to establish, and under the big picture, we, it is under the category of having a relationship between fellow mankind. Because all of this uh, are relationships that we build with its do's and don'ts, with its boundaries and parameters, the halal and haram, the macro, with regards to us and other fellow men. Right? So now we see how important it is to look at big principles because now we see what, the, what we do in a small package actually falls under what category. All right? And so in order to enhance this relationship, and then scholars develop uh, just in terms of the branch of fiqh, Right, uh, different various uh, faith. Right, but before we go there, now okay here, the various branches of faith. So, faith as we know are the rules, the harams, the permissible and forbidden, and what is encouraged and what is to be avoided. And so, just on the topic of faith alone, we have developed most of what we uh, we talk about, most of what we usually argue about, is simply one branch of faith, which is faith ibadah, a faith of worship the laws pertaining to ritual worship right so this this contain for example our prayers what are the things that we need to do what are the things that invalidate our prayers what are the things that makes our evolution valid and so on and so forth right and so this <coughs> are within the ambit of ibadah there's also this concept of the jinaya which in our modern context in this in in this part of our world we don't really embrace too much about this we don't learn too much about this but it exists so if in civil or secular law, we have criminal law, or in terms of its act, we have the penal code, Islam has its own fat jinaya, criminal law. And this is where an aspect, a small aspect of fat jinaya would be what we are familiar with, which is the hudud law. All right? And that's why we don't talk too much about it, because we don't even know what it contains. So this is another aspect of branch that we perhaps want to open our minds and look for places where they teach fat jinaya because it's such an abandoned part of it. And then we have Fiqh Munakahat. And this one most of, of us are familiar because at some point in our lives we, we get married. And so this establishes a relationship between us and our spouse. And this is the marriage of laws, uh, laws of uh, marriage and divorce. Um, so this Munakahat. And then there's also Fiqh Mu'amalat. Uh, Islamic laws of uh, business or commercial transactions. Right? Um, so just beyond our contract laws, what does Islam say with regards to some form of transactions? And the sad part is that now, especially the youth, are too obsessed with just focusing on the dinar and dirham without putting it into the context of a bigger picture, what is this context of fake mu'amalat that we are under, that we are obliged as Muslims beyond the uh, contractual law of, uh, of common law or civil law, right? So, you know, don't get too carried away with these movements of uh, dinar and dirham. Put that in context. How then, beyond just the exchange of money, of gold and silver, does my responsibility with regards to my transactions of a product, for example, or my payment for, for a service, is within the ambit of fake mu'amalat. And that is more important because then it governs how then do we deal with our dinar and dirham. Right? And then... <clears throat> 
we also look at how Sharia law is being derived. And this is important because sometimes we have uh, confusions in this and this leads to unnecessary uh, bickerings amongst Muslims. So Sharia law have two basic sources of law. One primary source which contains two sources. Of course, the first and foremost will be the Quran because there's the indisputable um, message and divine revelation from Allah and that's where primary sources of law comes from and every derivative must comply with this primary source which is the Quran. And then in the explanation or manifestation or a supplement to this first source or reference of law is the Sunnah. And these are the sayings and this constitutes three things. One is the Hadith, the sayings of the Prophet the Sunnah, the actions of the Prophet, and third, the affirmations of the Prophet without saying or without doing. So when he approves, he doesn't forbid, and he sees it, that means it is part of the Sunnah. So the Sunnah is not simply a Hadith, right? So it has these three components, right? So these two, the Quran and the Sunnah, constitutes the primary source of Sharia law. Everything, if you want to know the ruling for, we must go back to the first, the Quran, and if it's there and it's clear, we stop. If the Quran does not elucidate expressly what we are looking for, and then we look at the explanation or incidences in the Sunnah that may explain about it directly or indirectly about the issue that we're addressing. If we're able to come to a conclusion based on just these two, we stopped. Failing which, and then we go to the secondary source of, of law that constitutes Sharia law, um, and these combinations may vary depending on the schools of thought that we belong by, by and large. All right? The first one would be Ijma. Right? What is Ijma? Ijma, generally speaking, would be the consensus of the scholars. So, for example, we look for an issue and it is not contained expressly in the Quran. And we cannot find anything that guides us in the Sunnah or the Hadith or the affirmations of the Prophet, which either tells us directly or indirectly with regards to that issue that we are finding about. And then we have to get the scholars who have to gather and they have to deliberate on how then do we get guidance uh, in order to determine a fatwa, for example, on a certain issue. And if a whole scholarship in Islam agrees and there is a consensus, the decision of the consensus of the ulama or the scholars at a point with regards to this issue then becomes law and then becomes part of Sharia law. This was an easy concept before, right? particularly the time of the Prophet ﷺ, particularly the time of the uh, Rashidun period because all the scholars were living nearby and if there is an issue, um, they, will, they will be asked to come and then they will be asked to deliberate and then they will come up with their pronouncements. But now it's a little bit difficult because of distance perhaps, because of uh, lack of understanding or in other. So failing which, if there is no ijma or consensus of the ulama, and then move on to the, to the second source of law on the second resource, which is the qiyas. Which is, what is qiyas? It is a sort of um, a, a derivation from a familiar set of circumstances before that can be applied in this case by deductive analogy. Right, so, for example, an example of a kiyas would be, um, you know, in during the 70s where the flower generation, the hippie generation was, uh, you know, really popular. So people were taking, um, you know, smoking marijuana and whatever to get high. And so the scholars were faced with an issue. Is smoking marijuana or weed or pot legal in Islam? And so if you go to this exercise, there's, is, it, marijuana is not mentioned in the Quran. Marijuana is also not mentioned in the Hadith or the Sunnah. And so then it comes to the scholars uh, consensus. And somehow there was no consensus. So Ijma, right? So, uh, sorry, Qiyas. So what does Qiyas do? Okay, fine. So we don't have any exam direct example of regards to marijuana or weed or pot. But what is the effect of marijuana on someone? If you smoke, then you get high and then you lose your consciousness and then there's loss, you, you don't have any communication or relationship with God at that point where you're unconscious, right? So then the question is, what other things in life give something to that effect? And then if you trace all the way back, the scholars came to alcohol. So when you consume enough alcohol, 
you will lose consciousness and there's no communication with you and your Lord and you have no idea what you're doing because you're, you're drunk. And so by kias, by deductive analogy, if because alcohol is forbidden, therefore marijuana, pot or weed is also forbidden by the exercise of kias. You understand this? Right? Because you cannot find exactly this example in the Quran or the Sunnah. And if there's no consensus or ijma, then this is how you do your kias. While these are all derivative of uh, a consensual effort, failing which, when even in a big group, scholars cannot perform a kiyas, and there's differences, then we, they break apart, and then this is where ishtihad comes into being. Now, ishtihad means a personal opinion of a, per, a scholar with regards to a certain legal issue. So because there's no ijma, there's no kiyas, and we have to move on, so he make an ishtihad. My opinion on this matter is ABCD. And this is my opinion. You are free to choose to follow me or not. It is not encumbered. You are not, it does not have the, the weight as heavy uh, in terms of, comp uh, of, of following this, fat uh, this fatwa or this ishtihad as ijma or kiyas. That's why they are in ranks. Right? And so these are generally by and large, and this, I mean, we, we can have 10 months of courses, conducted 10 months of courses with regards to just this alone. But, you know, this, uh, to get, just give us a big picture. That not only Allah gives us um, a way of life, but this way of life is dictated by, for example, we talk about faith, there are various forms of faith, and how do we derive rulings in regards to this faith, and this is it, Sharia. Okay? And that's not enough. There is also a clear pronouncement on what is the purpose of Sharia. So that even scholars cannot abuse this and in our understanding of it as laymen, we will be able to impute some form of context with regards to any fatwa because this is the purpose of Sharia. And there are five. One, the maqasid or the purpose of Sharia is in the preservation of life, faith, intellect, progeny, property. That any fatwa that any legal decision that is made, irrespective of whoever you are, great great grand mufti or the president of, uh, you know, whatever, <laughs> right? It doesn't matter. And so that's the beauty of Islam. We, our hierarchy is so flat that anybody, everybody can have access to this, right? If anyone gives a fatwa or a command that you perform an act in contravention to this mahasid of Sharia, meaning that it does not preserve any of these five. In fact, if it abolishes or if it destroys any of these five, then it is incumbent, even as laymen, that we do not follow this fatwa. That we must reject because it is not part of Sharia. Of course, before we do that, you need to clarify because perhaps it is our understanding that we could not see the big picture. But even after that and we find that it does not fit into this maqasid or, or the objective of Sharia, then we cannot follow. So for example, if I give here and I say, well, um, I'm giving a fatwa, uh, all Muslims here, you should go and kill all the non-Muslims outside. Example, right? And you sit there and you cannot just take my word for it. And you think for yourself, what is the objective of Sharia? Is it, does it preserve life? No, it doesn't. Does it preserve my faith? No, because I'm just taking it without, without critical question. Does it preserve my intellect? Definitely not. Right? Does it preserve my progeny or the progeny of the person? Progeny is your descendants of the person I'm going to kill. It does not. So on all accounts, that fatwa, that command that I give you must be ignored. It doesn't matter who I am. You understand this? And this is, I think, the beauty in Islam because it gives every one of us the freedom to think about it for ourselves. After Allah gives us this uh, ambit of parameter how Sharia works like. And the big principle in which this Sharia law is being applied is contained every Friday before, at the end of the Friday prayers, before we perform our salat. Uh, the Imam says, Inna Allah ya'muru bil adli wal ihsan. Right? Uh, verily, Allah commands justice. And this is what we do. In everything that we perform with regards to Sharia, it must be in the preservation, in the path with the objective of performing justice. 
the doing of good to encourage people to do good and this week's khutbah we talk about uh, the fake of our priority and the whole big purpose of this fake of priority is that in the big picture we don't want to kill them in the beginning so we keep on encouraging, encouraging, encouraging people who are maybe not regular in their prayers. So we just say, you just carry on praying, you just carry on praying. Because in the end, when Allah opens their hearts, then they will pray five times a day. So this is in doing of good, in the big picture. And generosity towards kinfolk, kinfo, right? That you be kind to your parents. The Quran says you should not even say, oof. Or in our common parlance is, Psh. right? For example, Ustaz Zafaraman, go down and buy something for me. And you say, later lah, later lah. We can't even do that. And so this relationship with, between ourselves and our kinsfolk. And he forbid all shameful and indecent deeds and injustice and rebellion. So all this becomes a big general principle of the ambit within which Sharia is being applied. So just one last point before we extrapolate what is this big principle. So in this uh, long hadith, and I'm, you're all very familiar with this narrative in Bukhari. I treat my servant as the hopes that I would treat him. I am with him whenever he remembers me. If he remembers me in his heart, I remember him in my heart. Clearly, Allah is not talking about a physical heart. But can you imagine if you remember Allah in a small little heart? Right? The metaphorical um, proposition that, that the Prophet ﷺ is trying to make here is that you be remembered in a bigger, in a bigger heart, in the heart of Allah. If he remembers me in a gathering like this, maybe 30 of us in this gathering, I remember him in a gathering far better than this gathering. And the gathering of Allah will be the gathering of all the angels and the people of paradise. And there's a better gathering than this gathering. And this is where it becomes really beautiful. And then he said, If he draws near to me an arm's span, I draw near to him an arm's length. If he draws near to me an arm's length, I draw to him a fathom's length. So if you come to God in, this, in, the, in the distance like this, he comes to you an arm's length. Right? And, he, and then when you come to him at an arm's length, he, he's near to you at a fathom's length. That means a ghostly length. That means it's not a physical length. And technically speaking, it is probably face to face. And the whole idea and principle behind this explanation is then summarizes in the last statement, which is the epitome of this hadith. If he comes to me walking, I go to him running. So in reality, the demands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on us because of our limited nature, ability, capability, understanding uh, or, or just <laughs> our existence is that we simply are required to make a small effort towards Him walking and He then runs to you, right? Embraces you, bestows you with, with things, with blessings, with mercy that is beyond what you can imagine, beyond what you can even think of to ask of Him. So all that is asked of us is not to carry Mount Everest, but in a hadith, which uh, in this next hadith I'm talking about, a man was walking on his way and he saw a thorny branch and removed it from the way. All he did was to remove a thorny branch on the way. Allah became pleased with his action, loves him, forgive him and put him into paradise. And this is in Bukhari and Muslim. So you're not expected to, to do, you know, to carry, like I said, Mount Everest, technically speaking. We're just supposed to take that thorny branch and remove so that it makes the path to someone else whom we don't know easier and it does not injure him. What if it's a blind old man who then walks and then injures himself because he cannot see the, the thorny branch? But you have removed him, removed that branch, and you, do, you cannot expect to be rewarded because no one is going to re reward you. And so the sincerity is there and you avert, uh, you know, an accident to someone else. And this is where Allah becomes pleased with you, love you, and then forgives you. Right? And so all we need to do is just walk to Him, and then He comes and embraces you running. MashaAllah. Okay? And so, after looking at all these principles, right? Uh, at all these hadith, sorry, and all these uh, verses of the Quran, what principle can we extrapolate to guide us as a big principle in Islam that everything falls under? And so this third principle, there are two. One, by doing all this, Allah is really assisting us, helping us to establish and develop relationships. Right? Removing Tony Branch, relationship with a fellow mankind who we do not even know. Right? Knowing the Sharia, and when the scholars come together, is to build a relationship between what Allah intends to and how we manifest that intention. 
and they become the catalyst to try to interpret, extrapolate what was the intention and then apply to mankind. That's, that's essentially what Sharia is. So, and introducing to us this relationship, so it's beyond just simply faith, because faith is I believe, I believe, I believe. And this is the action, right? This is the one that really determines whether what you say you believe is actually believed. Because everybody can say I believe, everybody can say I love you, but what, how much are you willing to go for that belief, for that love, for that faith? And so this is what the Sharia does to manifest in practical terms those beliefs that you mentioned by your lips. So it is to build that relationship. So now I know how to show my faith, my love for Allah vis a vis my relationship because I'm guided by Sharia. And today we learn the purpose of Sharia, we learn the sources of Sharia, we learn even how these components are being uh, sub further divided so that it, you know you can manage our lives easier. This is because of relationship. And the second lesson to be drawn is that when we have established this relationship and then we act according to this relationship, meaning we don't find it a burden anymore to wake up at 5.30 to perform our prayers at Subo at 5.40. In fact, the better amongst us we say at 5 to perform some extra night virgils of the Hajjud or Isikhara or whatever it is. Or fasting because it is not a duty anymore. When you look at it as a duty, you are at a very superficial level with your Lord. Because this is my duty with regards to me and my Lord. But when you have evolved into a relationship, you do it because of your relationship. And this relationship necessarily brings you to, to have a sense of love, a sense of intimacy beyond duty. Because when it's duty, the heart may not be there. The body might be doing it, but the passion is not there. But if it's doing it as if it's, you're doing it because of a relationship, it is beyond the body, it is now the soul, it is now the beauty. And now your prayer, that's why you find sometimes it's beautiful sometimes it's empty because your your heart was present and that's why now you're because if you look at it it's not just me doing your five obligatory prayers it's because you had you want to have an intimate conversation with Allah and that's why you pray you want to talk to him you want to share with him what happens today you want to unleash the burden you've been faced with and so you said yeah Allah Allahu Akbar and then that's your communication and it begins it is no more duty. It is beyond the physical act of doing it. Your soul are now in, in fitra with existence because you are as one with your creator. And when that happens, and that, that will happen, inshallah, to all of you, and it will then transform you through your actions, through your speech, through your thoughts. And the simple reason is because once you have imbibed and appreciate this in your heart and so the general principle of islam the beauty of islam the mercy the compassion the you know uh, feeling empathetic towards your fellow brothers and yourself it all is all within your heart and it's contained here everything that comes out from your mouth every actions that you do every thought that emanates will come from that heart and this is the heart that loves allah that has uh, an intimate relationship with Allah that on a daily basis have this beautiful conversation and relationship with his creator and that's when you become a Khalifa you remember when we begin this school year two three months ago we talk about being a Khalifa for example you know whatever Allah bestows to you more than enough you 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 distribute it to others so that others may enjoy the blessings of Allah that was first level first second level you become a khalifa when god when the essence of islam is really present and is embraced within your heart it's no more thinking about being a khalifa it's just fitra because this is where such actions comes from is from a sense of beauty in your heart and hence the importance of finding beauty the importance of purifying your heart because everything emanates from that flesh and the prophet said if that flesh is bad everything comes up from it will be bad and if it's good everything that comes from this flesh will be good and that is the heart and one way of purifying this is to be completely to to have a better appreciation of where our faith stands and to understand to now relook and reacquaint with the knowledge that we have
and put them in the big picture so that we have a working relationship with our knowledge so that we can then transfer it into some form of action so that when we do everything that we do, the prayer for example, we know where it belongs, what is the purpose, what is it meant to transform us into. And when we know all that, we don't even have to consciously think of being a good servant, of, of being a good human being, of being a good Singaporean, of being a good Khalifa, because it comes from a beautiful place and that is where we can control. We can develop. And so let's hope that we will all be on the path, inshallah, to develop our hearts into a beautiful heart so that all our actions and our movements and our, our speech and our thoughts will come from a beautiful place. And um, inshallah, when that happens, it becomes um, uh, it becomes addictive and it spreads through our family members, our friends, and inshallah, the whole community soon. So we'll continue this uh, kuliah next week, inshallah, with other big principles. Um, and so we close to this kuliah by setting Tazbih Kafara and Surah Al Asr, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa atubu ilai. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa al-Asrina al-Insan fi khusr. إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر سرك الله نزيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته سينكس إن شاء الله.